Right. So, here we are. Selectors. Defective selectors. Myself, Luke Solomon, for the next two hours, talking about records, artists, music that shaped my life. Um, I was going to try and do it chronologically, but I'm not sure if that's going to work out. But I'll give it my best shot. Um, I thought it was appropriate for me to start with the uh, possibly the greatest inspiration of my life musically, without a shadow of a doubt. At the age of, uh, must have been 14, 13, 14, I listened to uh, Purple Rain for the first time and it changed my life. And I have been a Purple fan through thick, through thick and thin. <laughs> arguments the lot i've gone through them all rainbow children i mean i love that album um i can go in so uh there were so many to choose from but this is a record that hearing it in and out of context uh as part of 1999 which i kind of managed uh, to discover retrospectively after getting into purple rain and then hearing it fast forwarding and hearing it played in nightclubs uh, hearing it in a different way and I felt this was kind of an appropriate start um, to kick off the next two hours so yes this is the one and only the absolute top of the tree purple one Prince Rogers Nelson Check it. <laughs> Thank you. 
So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get a chance to play everyone. No, I'm not going to get a chance to play everything. I could probably do this double four or five hours of just sitting here and playing records to people and talking about them. Um, Prince, I'll probably play some more Prince um, at some point. But, uh, yeah, just, again, hearing Purple Rain for the first time and being a pre- pubescent, probably, but hearing a record like Darling Nikki and wondering what the... F- I mean, it, it, it floored me. I'd never heard anything like that before. And uh, all kinds of fantasies from hearing music like that and then seeing someone like Prince in the revolution and just thinking that was... That was it. That was that was totally it. This is exactly where I wanted to be in my life. Just this is the kind of music I wanted to listen to, and, and so yeah, the rest is here, 30 years later, and still listening to Prince. Um, next up is my other childhood <laughs> obsession. Uh, there's only one other DJ I know who probably takes it to further levels. Um, I don't like to talk about it quite as much as he does, but Ellie Escobar is uh, a huge Madonna fan. Um, I had posters on the wall. I was, it, yeah, it was just one of those things. But to, to roll with it, the music at that time, uh, through the 80s and into the 90s, for me, the greatest excitement was listening to those records, Jelly Bean producing records, and this particular one, which is Mark Kamen's. Uh, yeah, this is Madonna, everybody.
in the background. Madonna, everybody produced by Mark Cainans. I, um, yes, I remember all manner of records, but those early productions, sort of listening to those, and again, not being old enough to hear them in a club environment, and then hearing records like this in a club environment was just mind exploding. So, um, and it's it stuck with me. So yes, the Madonna. So the the third well, third love of my of my life, musical love of my life. If there was a mum and dad, Prince would be dad, and Shaka Khan would be mum. Um, again, a world of music to choose from. If I get the time to play other records, but this one in particular I've chosen because in I think. 84, 85, predominantly when I, I was living in Cyprus and breakdancing had, had hit the shores of Cyprus. Uh, a little delayed, but enough for me to be obsessed with Beat Street the movie, which is for me the greatest film ever made. And uh, with that in mind, I kind of would follow, look for the music that was played on the soundtrack and anything associated to it. And then there came the not so great uh, breakdance, Electric Boogaloo, Breakdance 2 was terrible. Um, but Shaka Khan featured quite heavily, I think Ain't Nobody on one of those. And that was an early beginning to like, oh my God, this voice, this is incredible. And um, yeah, this is one of those records, not the obvious choice because there are a lot to choose from, but this one holds a special place in my heart. Shaka Khan, this is my night.
Oh my goodness. It's amazing playing records, actually talking about them as well. And what they kind of mean to you, the goosebumps, the memories, everything that music does is uh, remarkable, really. I mean, it's um, life saving, that's for sure. Um, so, kind of staying in the 80s because I feel like transitioning through to where um, my taste started to develop. But I was hearing, I mean, I was fortunate enough to live through a period of time where pop music that was being played, like music like this, was being played on the radio, and you were hearing things that were uh, hits and to see how that music has traveled historically is, is incredible. You know, realizing the time that you're living through a really special period of music. And with that in mind, I think another thing that really changed, I think attaching culture to uh, music and I was always, with, with breakdancing, it was the clothes, the, the whole, the whole deal and going forward to kind of rave culture with the clothes, everything um, that attached itself to it. Um, and in the middle of all of that, you had all these kind of pop stars that were experimenting, but, but providing hits and Frankie Goes to Hollywood were absolutely, completely uh, up there for doing stuff that no one had ever done. And there was... Living in the UK, there was a, a number of things that had happened, but Tribe Called, uh, tribe called Quest, uh, Two Tribes, Relax, uh, these records were appearing, but then there were different 12 inches and different mixes and different things. I've never heard anything like that before, and it just... As a, as a music collector, I was just like, oh my God, I need to go and I don't have that, and I don't have that, and I don't have that. And that was kind of the beginning of my obsession of collecting records. Using this special and uh, this is one of those records that I, I remember, and I remember being on the radio, and I kind of, I didn't overlook it, I listened to it a lot, um, but not in this, this particular version. This I kind of it fell upon a little bit later. And for me, it's, it's just Trevor Horn, an absolute masterpiece, amazing record. Rage Hard, Frankie Goes to Hollywood Chicken. Around we go, under, through, up and under. Watch out here for the guitar. Let it sustain. Now, our favorite, the funky guitar. Sequencer. This will never let us down. Let it have its wicked way. We are sliding good, building fast. The perky percussion. And 
we shall be teased by a long, merciless reverb. The breakdown. So you can lie down. The whip. If you know what I mean. Do what you are told. Those repeat echoes. An essential part of the 12 inch is the climax. Yes. But first, yes. the anti climax. Electric disgust. Paul Rutherford, here for the smell of it. How does it feel? Do what you are told. Move with me over the thrill of the 12 inch. Do what you are told. The whip. Do what you are told. The whip. Do what you are told. The fall and the rise. The whip. The fall. The whip. We are sliding good. Building fast. The beginning and the end. The rush and the thrust, the speed and the sweat, the vocals of Holly Johnson. Tune in to Luke Solomon here on Defective Selectors. Cycling through um, as much as I can in a couple of hours, uh, a little bit of my, a snapshot of my musical history, uh, records, music artists that have uh, a part of my kind of makeup, my musical DNA, I guess. The record in the background is uh, a mix of Frankie Goes to Hollywood, Rage Hard, Trevor Horn. Uh, it was the first instrumental I guess that I'd heard in of, of a pop record that had done something different with it that I wasn't kind of familiar with remixes I didn't really understand what they were and what they did and what the point of them was um, until again later on hearing those records in clubs and just thinking oh this why is this so familiar and realizing that I had these records and uh, yeah Frankie Goes to Hollywood absolutely legendary so staying in the 80s still um, and going back to my breakdance obsession. Party people, party people, they don't get funky. This was uh, another one of those records that I, I just never heard anything like it. I mean, sonically, it was like, oh my God, this is, what is this? This is from the future. Uh, it still sounds like it's from the future. Um, I never really looked at labels and names and who was behind them until a lot later on, but uh, still an absolute landmark record. Planet Rock. Make your body It 
Africa Bombata. Again, that was uh, not just a, a musical thing, but a visual thing. I think um, just an act that looked like they were from out of space. And as a teenager, young teenager, your the visual aspect to music was 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 important to me. Anyway, I, I like to. You know, looking up, I mean, if I had the chance to play all the records, you know, acts like Culture Club, Boy George, seeing people like that for the first time. Bowie is a great example. Um, this just outer space thing has always been an attraction to me. And uh, with that in mind, this was a kind of a discover, discovery um, inadvertently through exploring music. But another a, a band act, I mean, there's a whole world of psychedelic funk. But uh, yeah, this is One Nation Under a Group. Dance our way out of our constriction. Call the beat freaking up and down the hang up alleyway. With the groove I only got, we shall all be moved. Ready or not, yeah.
segue I know from Planet Rock to that but there is um, there is reason behind that there was a weird sort of no man's land in my life I wasn't listening to lots of different music uh, all at once I mean it was just before kind of rave had really taken a hold of me <laughs> um, and when I say taking a hold that's definitely what happened um, and while all that was going on I was hearing records which I will play um, but I was being drawn towards this sound which um, I'd hear, we'd go to a, living, growing up in Western Supermare, go to a, a local club called Hobbits. And uh, essentially it was like a dark goth club. Monday nights was like a free for all. The ravers, or the pre ravers, the proto ravers, I guess, would descend upon this club and just, there was a DJ, there was a few DJs at the time um, that were local uh, and not so local that had come from London that were playing music. And it was kind of freestyle, so you'd hear records around at the time, like stuff like Soul to Soul and breakdance records, things like Planet Rock, and then you'd hear like funk. And I remember hearing records like this and just thinking, this is, I need to know more. And uh, that leads me to the next song, uh, which is the next artist, in fact, which is, I guess, after kind of Prince Chaka Khan, he's sort of top of the tree for me. James Brown, I mean, where do I start and end? It's it's that sound. It's like hearing music the way I wanted to hear it and the way I wanted to hear the bass and the way I wanted to feel it and all of those things. He kind of nailed it in so many ways and then as a live performer, uh, wow. Uh, but yeah, this is, I hope, this is James Brown, The Papers. I'm ready. I can dig scrapping. 
Yeah. No, no one, no one does it like him. I think, uh, I think that was quite significant actually. The fact that I uh, heard this again, music that everything that you kind of pull from in your life, the way that you want to hear sounds, the way you want to feel sound and stuff. I mean, maybe it's maybe it's me. Maybe I'm a minority in some ways, but I think that your ears kind of tune into particular things that develop as you get older and sounds and all of that kind of starts to infiltrate in different ways. And I think as a, as a producer and a music maker, which came later, um, I was drawing from all of that stuff, like the funk and the sound of the drums and the beat and all of those things. And James Brown was a marker for me. Um, so while I was listening to this music in the 80s, there was a kind of rare groove moment. Uh, something that was kind of bubbling away and I was fortunate enough to be um, to discover it quite early on I guess in my kind of 16, 17 so 86, 87 given my, my age so that's great um, and <laughs> it was something I remember being underneath a motorway uh, like you like you do on, on a <laughs> late at night with a strobe at one end somewhere under the M4 and hearing a number of records one of them was Jerry Beltram's Energy Flash uh, there were a few others but significantly there was a sound and something that had happened that just made me go oh my god this is it this is the next part of my life and this is a record that signifies those moments, even though potentially came a little later, um, it's still a record that just again gives me goosebumps. Dion, come get my loving.
You're listening to Luke Solomon here on Defected Selectors. Thanks for tuning in. I'm, I'm getting all your messages and I, I'm massively... Uh, <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> I've just noticed there's loads of messages. And I'm reading through them and I promise it's trying to re- recollect all this stuff and, and acknowledge you all, but I, I massively acknowledge and I appreciate it. And also uh, the fact that I am from Western Super Mayor seems to be resonating. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah. So that's quite funny. Yeah, Western Supermare, to be fair, in the 80s was was generally a really fascinating place to grow up around rave culture because we had a mixture of everything. We had a mixture of people coming from uh, uh, Toby Chino, uh, uh, particularly as a DJ I remember, uh, who works with the Sancho Panza crew, uh, was playing regularly, um, and various other DJs that were playing Monday night and playing music that was mixing up Rare Groove and stuff like Soul to Soul and then as this music appeared it became more and more that until we were all just dancing on chairs and and freaking out and that's all we wanted to hear and with that in mind the next record is another one of those records that uh, you I mean I think I was too young to be at a point where I understood that a DJ was I knew what a DJ was, but the idea of going up and looking at a record to see what they were playing was not really, it's just not something that happened that much. I mean, I might be wrong, I'm sure there were people doing it, but uh, if I had been that guy, which I became, um, it was, yeah, I would have been doing it to this because I'd heard it and I remember just not knowing no Shazam, so needed to find out what it was. And it took a minute, uh, but when I found out, That was it, really. Frankie Knuckles. Jamie Principal. Your love. With all the cracks and authenticity, there you go.
So, um, while all that was going on, I have to go a little bit backwards to move forward, so th there is a, a segue to all of this. But um, while I was discovering uh, dance music, uh, amongst other things, <laughs> excuse me, um, I had also become collecting records regularly, not as a DJ, just as a collector, and, and was obsessed with Talking Heads and everything about them. Uh, again, very much like a sonic thing and a rhythmic thing and the fact, I guess, that it was 4-4, kind of subconsciously that was going on. And one of the branches that came from that was the Tom Tom Club. And this was something I think probably predominantly Island Records did and I became an obsessive collector of all things on Island Records uh, but especially from this era, era uh, and people that were parts of records and played on records and produced it so I think I was starting to kind of dig deeper into understanding why I like things like who why I love the keyboard sounds why I loved all these different things and, and this particular record was uh, definitely another watershed for me uh, hearing music like this again kind of shapes the future of what I felt I wanted to be a part of and, and the kind of music I wanted to at least attempt to try and do in some way. Uh, never quite achieving it, but yeah, this is uh, the amazing, wonderful Tom Tom Club. You listen to Luke Solomon here on Collected Silver. <laughs> Oh, oh, 
Yes. Tom Tom Club. Genius in Love. A breakaway act from the legendary Talking Heads. Uh, went on to be successful in their own right. Uh, Wordy Rapperhood was another amazing record, amongst others. Um, again, for me, this was very much a sound, like it was something that um, I was drawn to. Weird noises, <laughs> predominantly. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, yes, weird noises is very much a thing that's been uh, kind of representative throughout my life. Um, so amongst all of this, I, it's hard actually to do. I'm an hour in and I'm jumping around a lot and I apologise for that, but there's some kind of thread amongst all of it. I'm sure you can find it. Um, again, I've some, my, my mind is kind of shaping into, it's, you know, reaching my kind of 1920s. And uh, again, someone had given me a mixtape um, and I used to go and sit in my dad's car and play mixtapes because I could shut the doors and turn it up really loud and not be disturbed. Sitting in cars and listening to music was my absolute favourite thing to do. Just listening to loud music, full stop. And on this mixtape, the next two tracks I'm going to play, but this was the first one. And... Uh, I'll play this, Electro 101, talking with myself, Frankie Knuckles. Again, Frankie Knuckles infiltrating my life and not really being, uh, having the, the, I just, I, it was music that I just thought, wow. Um, and realized a little later on, not much later on, that this Frankie Knuckles was, I mean, I'm not growing up in Chicago was a big factor of not really understanding the impact of that as something that I wish I had done. And I was fortunate enough to spend a lot of time there, which I'll go into shortly. Um, but hearing this record for the first time and the record that follows, um, I'll, I'll explain the thread there. But yeah, this is ridiculous.
next big thing And how wish we a command Telling me to hold your hand Oh baby brain Yeah, that's um, Electro 101 talking with myself, Frankie Knuckles mix, uh, again another masterpiece. So the mixtape that I had, I have no idea who gave it to me or where it came from, um, at this record and the next record and the next record, uh, there was a, there's a lot of things attached to the next record. Firstly, it was uh, an incredible record, and so there's that. And then secondly, I actually was fortunate enough um, to become very good friends with the producer. And, and this is um, well, the artist, the producer, one of the writers. Um, and, and also, well, <laughs> I'll rephrase that. The couple that were involved in this became close, close friends. And I think it was um, a great example of me being a like a real fanboy, but I guess not in a stalkery kind of way, but uh, at least I hope not. Uh, no one's told me that I was a stalker, so, so that's good. Uh, maybe behind my back they are, but I, I just, definitely not to my face. And I think for me, being a fan has always been absolute, like number one thing, like a music fan. And then getting to know the people behind music and being, and, and then getting to know them and then have, have, Hearing the stories, I, I mean, I never ever thought that that would be, as a kid, if that would be something, I to pinch myself now, that something that I could ever have imagined. And uh, this is one of those records. And still to this day, I, I went on to form a huge friendship. I am now, uh, I think they may have forgotten, but I st <laughs> I'm hoping they have, although I'm making this public. Um, I still have their 303 that this record was uh, part, partly made of, I think, and the 808. Uh, but if anyone sees them, obviously don't tell them that, that I still have that. Um, so yeah, this is the beloved Sunrise.
the summarizing. The beloved. So I uh, am fortunate enough to call John Marsh and John and Helena Marsh uh, close friends. And they were definitely a springboard or part of a springboard into music in many ways, not just hearing this record and and being a huge fan and being a fan of theirs, but um, getting to know them. And then when we first started out as Freaks, which was the band that I was in with Justin Harris, uh, they were kind enough to lend us uh, a mixing desk. Uh, and then a little later on, uh, John lent me his 808 and his 303, which I still have. And so I'm, I mean, it, it, it still blows my mind that I get to be able to talk about that, but it was all again part of the makeup of all of the music that I became obsessed with as a fan and a collector. And I guess as a fast forward here uh, uh, and segueing into the next part of my musical journey, uh, trying to keep <laughs> trying to keep it all within two hours. Really, it's quite tricky. Uh, but my obsession with Chicago, which started really early on, and uh, I worked in a record shop in Barnet called Stop On By with Ty Holden who was uh, definitely an early kind of mentor of mine and heard a mixtape of his and it it blew my mind I, I mean music on there that I hadn't heard before in a context that I'd not heard before uh, Blaze, Sympathy uh, Wild Pitch Records DIY Records that he put together and this kind of 120 BPM, Deep House, essentially early Deep House. And uh, I became a good friend of his and working at the record shop opened the door to becoming a proper fanboy and stalking people and becoming their friends, which is definitely a thing. And uh, it led to me getting a job at Freetown Records. And whilst I was working at Freetown, um, I'd also I can't remember if it was a little later, but I, was, I started DJing on a pirate radio station called Girls FM. And this record appeared at the record store, actually prior to Freetown. So this record appeared at the, at the record store. And I, and I remember Ty and me battling to play it first on the radio, and we were just floored. Uh, this was like nothing that we'd ever heard before. It was the, the real deal, like real deep house. Okay, what is this? Where, you know discovered it was Shay Damio, Ron Trent, uh, remix, round one, I'm your brother. And again, this was the beginning of a whole nother chapter of my life, uh, which was very much with Chicago in its foundation and traveling to Chicago, meeting Shay and Ron, becoming good friends, and then meeting Derek Carter and starting classic. So that's the next part of this journey.
Round one. I'm your brother. That was uh, that was another record that changed a lot for me. Hearing that for the first time, obsession with Chicago, and then hearing a lot of Derek Carter records, and then I'd look at records, and there would be phone numbers on records, and for the most part, the phone numbers on the records would be for the artists to the artists themselves or the record label, which a lot of the times the record, the uh, the artist was the record label. So I managed to speak to Shay Damier that way, and in turn, I kind of developed a phone call relationship with Derek Carter. Fast forward a little bit, working at Freetown Records, I'd uh, met Ron Trent. Ron Trent signed a record to Subwoofer, which was a uh, subsidiary of Freetown, and we became friends and I was in the studio working on music uh, Rob Mer with Rob Mello who had, had become a studio mentor to me and taught me a lot. Uh, in the early days it was very much him and me sat there saying oh, I like this, I don't like that, I like this, I don't like that. And between me, Rob and Zaki, we worked on some music that we wanted to release on Prescription which is Shea, Damier's, Shea and Ron's label and that happened. Uh, we put a single out and as part of that uh, and working for Freetown I ventured out to Chicago uh, which is where I met Derek Carter and Derek Carter gave me this record which has his scribble on and his writing and that was the beginning of our lifelong friendship uh, this was a, a huge and still is a huge record to me Tripping Among the Stars, Sound Patrol
Derek Carter, Chris Suzuka, Sound Patrol. Uh, that was a, actually an original record that was given to me by Derek when I went out to Chicago. Uh, something I will cherish. Um, I'm very fortunate to have and very fortunate to become very close friends with Derek Carter and then actually him moving to my house um, he shared he had a room at uh, our house in Barnet when he first kind of came out the second time he came out to the UK but he kind of established himself over here and he lived with me uh, for about a year or so we were doing space at Bar Rumba and we became uh, close friends obviously because <laughs> we started a label together um, but just rewinding slightly, I going out to Chicago was a light bulb moment because I was I got to see something else, which I, I it was like going to school. It was literally sorry, my phone's going off. Um, it was literally going to school for me because I was witnessing DJs and moments in clubs that I'd never seen before. I, I, I just didn't know. I didn't know about crossovers. I didn't know about cutting bass off of. I didn't know about playing records in and out of context, like mixing up old records with new records. I mean, that was obviously a thing, but playing them over the top of, I remember hearing DJ Rush playing Michael Jackson over the top of an acid track and Derek doing something similar and playing on three turntables and and then other DJs like DJ Heather and, and Mark Farina and Diz and uh, Josh Werner and and I it was I just revelationary I, revelatory is the word and it it just I, I felt like I needed to start at that point that was the kind of start button it was like right, okay this is it for me this is how I want to DJ this is all the things that I want to be a part of and feel a part of and be allowed to be a part of and I was welcomed and and, and part and made a, an honorary Chicago a member of Chicago the, t the city of Chicago by all of the house community which I'm eternally grateful for um, but whilst all that was going on I was doing a lot of record shopping out there and and hearing a lot of DJs and hearing records that I'd never heard before because I hadn't grown up in that environment and I was too young and I, you know, it was it was not on my radar. Um, and this was kind of the beginning of my foray into exploring other music um, and looking for things in the electronic world that, I mean, I'm talking over Derek now. Um, and this is one of those records. Again, for the first time, hearing this record and hearing it on an amazing sound system, and, and and having I didn't have any prior knowledge of it, so for me it was again a moment of just wow, wow, what is this? Um, this is recently reissued, actually. Uh, Rude movements, check it.
some palace room movements. I mean, this is a great example of hearing music that was different to other music from that genre. And I think it's probably predominantly because it's a drum machine. Um, and so it kind of puts it in a different place for me. And I think that's what I was kind of drawn to, that hearing something that just didn't feel like it didn't fit in the space it was supposed to fit in, um, which is a theme throughout my life. Um, and I think music like this that I was being exposed to in Chicago uh, for the first time outside of what I grew up in the UK, I feel very uh, uh, I'm glad to have been exposed to that, I guess. And, and that's uh, that led to this whole obsession of collecting and collecting and collecting and buying records. And this next record falls into that category. I was familiar with it. It kind of came and passed me by. I think maybe I'd heard it on the radio and stuff as a kid, but it was uh, a record that I went on to become completely and totally obsessed with. This is Will Power's Adventures in Success. Thank you. 
Will Powers. Adventures in Success was part of a, like a self-help album, Will Powers. This song actually <laughs> written by, I'm not sure where, at what point that is part of it, but Robert Palmer and Sting. So um, this is kind of fascinating. I don't know where, the, what bit they played in it. I think, uh, uh, what does this thing play? The lute. Maybe he played the lute on it. So, staying in Chicago, discovering music like this for the first time, my mind just opening, just broadening, my taste broadening, and, and really kind of drilling into what the real part of my kind of makeup was becoming, what, where I was heading sonically. And amongst all of this, there were a lot of characters that played a part of shaping my musical life. Uh, one of those characters is a, a DJ called Gemini, Spencer Kinsey. Someone who I met through uh, Derek, DJ Sneak, Derek Carter. Uh, and we became very good friends. He came to play for us at Space at Bar Rumba. He used to stay with me. And he became like kind of a mentor to me, actually. Um, <laughs> but absolutely kind of fascinating and incredibly ta talented, uh, troubled soul, unfortunately. And while he, whilst he was staying with me, he uh, would play a dats of music he'd been working on. And a few of those things we signed to Classic. There was a number of things that we did, we signed, I worked with him on. And uh, Gemini Spencer Kinsey, um, is probably up there with one of the greatest DJs that I've ever heard. Uh, one of the most out there, but brilliant producers that I've ever heard. And this is one of his records, which is amazing.
Whoa, feedback. You're tuned to Luke Solomon here on Defected Selectors. It's me talking about music that shaped my my DNA. Um, we're kind of where well, we're running out of time, and I'm trying to I'm trying to fit in all the great inspirations in my life and things that have happened to me along the way and stuff that really kind of influences and shapes everything you do. And music is so massively important, probably the, one of the biggest things, especially in my life. Spencer Kinsey, Gemini, We Are The Future. Originally on Classic. Um, unfortunately, Spencer's past kind of uh, went uh, not in the way I guess that he was planning um, and through a lot of kind of mental struggle and turmoil which uh, has been a theme throughout uh, my life with a lot of relationships and losing Kenny Hawks is a, a particular thing it's that we are in a very kind of fragile world and fragile space in the creative space of of trying to uh, navigate through uh, ego and and confidence and, and being appreciated for what you do and battling with uh, demons and all of those things and sometimes it gets to the, the better of us uh, unfortunately um, but at the same time it's amazing to have left a legacy or have a legacy and left a legacy and Jim Spencer's as far as I'm aware Spencer's still around but uh, yeah it's having a legacy is 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 a, an incredible thing and I, being able to talk about music and reminisce and it conjures up so many things so uh, I'm kind of hitting a full stop there because I'm running out of time and I wanted to play this record because I think it's vitally important that these this particular duo how uh, what a huge impact they have had on my musical life uh, and there's a whole other story and there's a whole other part to this really about talking about those things uh, but very much so probably up there with the most amount of records I have in my collection after Derek Carter or alongside, actually no, before Derek Carter because of the amount of records they've made. Uh, this is Louis Vega, Kenny Dope, um, New York and Soul. It's all right, I feel it.
Poignant, lyrically poignant, and of course, it's masters of work. So what can I say? I mean, when it comes to house music, they did it for years. Um, so I'm ending. I think I'm ending on this record. It's hard to know. But I'm so used to looking at digital screens and having you know, this how much time I've got. But I feel like this is potentially a great ending. It's a record again from Chicago, from Shea Daniel. It was the open record on the first ever mix. I did the distance uh, way back in the 90s and it still stands up there with probably my favourite house of the time. And I think sentimentally, lyrically, all of those things, it kind of says it all for everything that I kind of feel uh, emotion towards. But this is dedicated to those that you love and love Dan Lost too. And all of those people that have kind of been part of something, I've been mean, talking about it all, about how, how fortunate I am to have experienced all these things and to talk about them with music and stuff. And hopefully at some point we can do a part two and I can dig deeper because I really didn't get to, to go in. Um, but I think I kind of said something anyway. Uh, this is Luke Sol, you've been listening to Luke Sol for the last two hours on Defected Selectors. Uh, hopefully we will have recorded this and you'll be able to watch it again somehow, somewhere, if you want to, or, you know, let's see. Um, but yeah, sign me off.
that's it. You've been tuned in to Luke Solomon here on Defected Selectors in the background. That's Shay down there, close. An absolute, just, what a record. Thanks again for tuning in. Hugely appreciated and sorry I didn't get to, you know, reading out comments and stuff, but I was just in the midst of it all. So apologies for that, but I appreciate all the lovely comments. Uh, hopefully we'll do this, we'll do part two, that would be amazing. Um, until next time though, this is me signing off.